I would just like to say a warm welcome from my side as well. It is great to be with you guys, even though we aren't physically meeting in person. And I must say it is quite weird that as we're streaming this live from the venue, I'm so used to having all of you guys in front of me, but now it's just a few people. And uh, yeah, so I know it's strange times that we're living in and it would have been so nice to have seen your faces. Um, but, we, but we will make the best of what, we, what is given to us. So um, I'm just so excited for the word that um, we, I will be sharing tonight. The Lord just gripped my heart with this, with this word. And uh, I'm just so expectant that, that He will just come and speak to us and just come and work in our hearts and work in our minds. So last week we... We started with a new sermon series, and the sermon series is titled Strangely Dim. And the reason why we as a leadership decided on this sermon series is that there's so much going on in the world at this moment. And we've been in the, in the midst of this pandemic for more than a year and a half now, and we're in the mid of the, the third wave, and just so much chaos going on, and so much uncertainty, so much fear, so much things that wants to come and overwhelm us. And so many people being in a place of not knowing what tomorrow looks like. And we as a leadership decided that but we want to speak into this because we do know that it is God's heart that we are not left alone as orphans, but that, that, that we are taken care of and that we actually live a life that is storm-proof, even in the midst of storms. So our hearts behind this sermon series is really to build something into our lives that will help us to remain standing in the midst of the storms. So last week, Pastor Seviwe preached the message, and I just love that title so much, Jesus, the Non-Anxious Presence. And the more I say that, the more that just that very sentence just encourages my heart, knowing that in the presence of Jesus, if I just stay long enough in the presence of Jesus, I can experience Him ministering to all of my anxiety, all of my fears, all of the things that wants to come and overwhelm me. And I can just experience Him ministering His peace, just bringing His wisdom into our, our circumstances. And the one phrase that Pastor Zaviwe said is that we, don't want, we want to be at a place where we respond to God and where we do not react to whatever the world is saying to us or what, the world, what is happening in the world. And that was just such an encouraging word for me. So this week we will be going into what one of the disciplines is or one of the things that we can build into our lives so that we can remain standing, so that we can experience the non-anxious presence of Jesus. So tonight I will be speaking about prayer and listening. And if you have been part of this church for quite some time, you'll know that prayer is a topic that we've been speaking on since lockdown started last year. And we are not planning on stopping speaking about prayer anytime soon because we really do believe that in this time that we need to draw closer to God and we need to commune with God and we need to be in prayer before God. So I'm so excited to once again to be to have the opportunity or the privilege to speak to you guys on prayer and on listening and how we can build this into our lives. So when it comes to prayer, I thought it good to start off just with a definition of what, what, what is going on in my mind when I'm speaking about prayer. And it's not a very <laughs> a big definition, it's actually a very simple definition. And for me, prayer is talking with God. Not talking to God, but talking with God. And what that implies is it's actually being in conversation with God. It's not just a place of me speaking to God and me speaking to God, me speaking to God, but it's actually a place where I also allow God to speak to me. And that will be the listening part. But it's such a privilege to know that we can actually be in conversation with the Creator of the universe and that we can actually have the privilege of hearing His voice, of hearing the Creator speaking into our lives, speaking into our circumstances, and being in the presence of our Creator. Now, as we are going into prayer, the, the passage that I've been meditating on the most 
for this past year and a half is the actual passage where Jesus was teaching his disciples on how to pray. And I'll quickly just want to read that. And it's found in Matthew 6 from a verse. I'm going to be reading from verse 6 until verse 13. And it says, and this is now Jesus speaking, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And this is a portion of Scripture that we are all so familiar with. Most of us learned this prayer as a child. And because of that, we have the tendency to just brush over the Scripture. When we're reading the Scripture, we just read it and we go on, we spend like one or two minutes on it, and then we just go on to, because we are so familiar with this piece of, with this passage, that we actually miss what is standing here. And I'm so convinced that if we can capture the heart of Jesus behind this passage, that we will have such a, such a prayer life that is so alive and that is so vibrant, that if we can really understand what Jesus wanted to teach us, because Jesus had the ability to take such big truths and to bring it down into simple, simple, simple words. And that is exactly what he did here. So when we go to, um, in verse 6, it says that, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And from that, we learn that prayer is all about and it starts off with a conversation with the Father. So if we really have a revelation of who God the Father is, that will immediately stir within us the will to want to actually pray. But when we are in prayer, we should always know that we are going in prayer primarily to speak to our Father, to have a conversation with our Father. So it's so important that we actually know what the Father is like. Because if we have wrong beliefs about God, the way that we speak to Him will actually determine, will be determined by what, by what we believe about Him. So if I believe He's not interested in my life, I will not necessarily be willing to divulge all of the details of my life before God because He's not interested in what I have to say. So it's so important that we actually search the Scriptures, that we search the Scriptures to find the knowledge of God, to know who this God is that we are speaking to. Because I can, be, I can promise to you that the God that we are speaking to is more interested in our lives than we can ever imagine. He wants to be involved in our lives more than we could ever actually want Him to be involved in our lives. And this God is so holy, He's so loving, He's so gracious, He's so merciful, He's so steadfast, He's so faithful. He's even just and He's good. And there's so much more that can be revealed to us regarding God the Father. But when we do go into prayer, we have the privilege of saying that we are going into our room and we are shutting the door behind us and we are going to have to co a conversation with our God, with our Father. And then it says in verse 7, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. So by that we, we just see that prayer is not about the amount of words that we speak, but it's actually about what is going on in our hearts. And can we just open up doors of our heart and actually in vulnerability show God what is going on in our lives and speaking the words that is coming directly from our hearts. So we do not define 
good prayer by the amount of words that we pray, but actually about, about the words that is directly coming out of our hearts towards God. That we want to just come in vulnerability before Him, just come before Him who we are and saying what is going on in our lives. Being transparent. And then it goes on to say in verse 8, Do not be like them, that's now the Gentiles, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And knowing this, that what Jesus is saying there, that before we even go into prayer, God already knows what we need. And by that, I just gather from it that prayer is not about primarily about my prayer requests or about, or about my needs or what I want to get from God. And if I have a revelation of who God the Father is, I will know that He already knows what I need. He already knows what needs to take place in my life. So therefore, when I go in prayer before God, I, my primary focus does not have to be my prayer needs, my, what I want to happen in my life. But I can take the focus off of my needs and what I want to happen in my life, and I can actually point it somewhere else. So Jesus says, do not be like them, for, they, for your Father knows that you need before you ask Him, what you need before you ask Him. So He does not want us in in prayer primarily to be focused on what we need but he wants us to turn our attention to and then he says pray then like this our father in heaven so he wants us to start off by turning our attention on who god is allowing the revelation of who god is allowing the knowledge of who god is to come into our lives and to meditate on that and the, the knowledge and the revelation of god isn't something that is far off we can literally just open up our Bibles and this, the, the pages of this Bible is just oozing the character of who God is. So the wisdom and the revelation that we want of the knowledge of God isn't something that is far off, but it is something that is so near. And, and Jesus taught us that when we go into prayer, let us primarily just start off by focusing on who God the Father is, allowing the revelation of who He is to come in, work in our hearts and work in our minds. And then he says that there's three prayer requests that we then that we have that is towards God, and then the second three prayer requests is towards man. But we start off by saying, Okay, God, I want to meditate on who you are. But now I want to pray, first of all, that your will, uh, that, that your name will be hallowed, that your name will be glorified, that your name will go out to the into the earth and be revered. And then secondly, that your kingdom will come. Not my kingdom. Your kingdom. And then the third prayer request that relates to God is that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if I as a person is extremely self-centered, I won't necessarily want to be praying the Our Father. Because those first three sentences have nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with God. It has everything to do with God's name, with God's kingdom, and with God's will. And an eager desire in us to have His name be hallowed, to have His kingdom come, to have His, to have his will be done. So my own self-centeredness is actually keeping me from engaging in prayer before, the, before God the Father. Where, where I want to make things about my name, about my kingdom, or just about my will. And the reason why we need to have the revelation of who God is, because if we know who God is, that we will know that it doesn't matter for my name to be glorified, it doesn't matter for my kingdom to come or my will to be done, because living for God is life and life in abundance. And therefore, I do not need to be self-centered. Therefore, I can take a step of faith and say, Lord, I'm going to take what I want for myself or my self-centeredness. I'm just going to place it aside and I'm going to take a, prayer of, a step of faith and just meditate and pray into who you are. Put that as primary importance before me. And then as we engage with God, engaging with His name be hallowed, with His kingdom to come, with His will to be done, 
that will tremendously affect what we actually want in our own lives. It will start shaping the desires that we have in our lives. And that we will see that the desires in our life will start changing more in accordance with the, with the kingdom of God. And then he says, now there's the three prayer requests that relates to man. First of all, give us this day our daily bread. Unfortunately, it's not our annual bread or our monthly bread or even our weekly bread. It is our daily bread. So there God reveals His heart that He wants us to be dependent on Him. And He wants us to be so dependent on Him like the Israelites, the Israelites was when they had to go out daily to pick up their manna. He wants us to be on him, dependent on Him daily. Praying for Him, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Then there's also the second prayer request which concerns about relationships. It's, go, it's about relationships. And it says that, give, uh, that uh, give us this day our daily bread and then it goes on and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That's all about having relationships restored. Having an eager desire for our relationships with our fellow family or friends or even our colleagues for the relationships to be restored, for forgiveness to be given and to receive forgiveness. And then lastly, that he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Because most of us think that we might be untouchable, that we are not able of being deceived or we are not able to uh, actually go astray. So it's actually only when we realize how needy we are or how easily deceived we are that we will actually pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's actually only when we realize that apart from God, we cannot live an upright life, that we cannot live a godly life. Apart from God protecting us, it is impossible for us to live a life that is not influenced by the evil one, that is not given over to temptation. So as we are just going, reflecting on the Our Father, there's so much more that can be said regarding the Our Father. And it's such an amazing prayer, and I'm, I'm just planning on to, to keep on meditating on, on this prayer for years and years and years to come. Saying, Lord, keep on showing to me, keep on building this prayer into my life so that I can align my life with prayer in the way that you want it to happen. But as we also read this prayer, this is just us speaking to God. But our Father is us speaking to God. And like I said at the beginning, that prayer is not just speaking to God, but there comes a place where we actually need to listen to God. And for me, it is almost more important for me to be able to listen to God and to focus on listening to God than to speaking to God. Because speaking to God comes more naturally to me. And listening to God is sometimes a lot harder. Because even as a, as a young Christian, I believed that how is it possible for me to hear God's voice? So I, I didn't have confidence to even want to listen to His voice or give Him the opportunity because I just believed I couldn't hear His voice. But... And this is so that is so amazing that we can just go to God even in our uncertainty of <laughs> where we sometimes struggle to believe that He wants to speak to us and say, Lord, I just want you to come and speak to me. And what I've found that sometimes I just need to say, Lord, I'm just going to stay five minutes longer in your presence, giving you five more minutes of air time just to come and speak to me. Even though I'm uncomfortable, even though I don't know necessarily whether you are going to speak to me. I'm just going to stay five more minutes. I'm just going to give you five more minutes where I'm not going to be just speaking to you, but just listening, allowing you to come and speak into my life. And I can really just guarantee that if we do that, and, we, and if we do that on a daily basis, that there's absolutely no way that God will not speak to you. There's absolutely no way that you will not hear the voice of God. For us, we, we just shouldn't get discouraged if maybe God at the first or second time does not speak to us. But we'll just say, Lord, we're just going to keep on coming. We're just going to keep on coming into your presence. We're going to keep on giving you the place to speak into our lives. Why? 
Because hearing the voice of God is so supremely important in, in us actually living for His kingdom. And having one word that is spoken by God can have a greater effect than a thousand words that I can speak for, out of my own. So ac actually listening to God is the place where we say, God, come and speak into my life. I want to have your wisdom in my life. And me being able to, want to listen to God actually confirms whether I'm dependent on God or, or not. If I can use an example, if I'm, as a 32-year-old, I now go into a classroom where a grade one student is going to learn how to do plus and minus, or I don't know, <laughs> they are just basic mathematics. I will not necessarily listen very attentively to that teacher because I already know how to do all of, all of those basic mathematics. So I'm not dependent on her to give me her knowledge or to speak into that area of my life because I don't have need in that life or I, it's not something that I need to listen to her. But say, for instance, I go into a master's class in, in quantum mechanics. <laughs> I will be so dependent on that professor speaking into my life and listening to every single word he's saying because I'm dependent on him to take this that I don't understand and make it actually understandable to me. So the mere fact that I'm listening to him actually proves that I'm dependent on what he actually wants to say to me because I, apart from him speaking to me, I don't have necessarily the understanding so that I can understand what, what the, this thing, as an example, quantum mechanics. So me being in a place of actually wanting to listen to God proves that I want to be dependent on God or proves that I am dependent on God. So it's only the, ma the, the manner or the, how dependent we are on God will then translate into how well we listen to Him or how often we listen to Him. The more dependent we are on Him, the more we will listen to Him. So, but then, obviously, <laughs> there's not just God's voice that wants to speak to us. But there's also the voice of the world that wants to speak to us. So in our lives, there, there, there comes a battle between the wisdom of God and then the wisdom of man. And the wisdom of man is just so entangled into our very fabric because from a small little child, the wisdom of man is actually being brought into my life. You need to live in this way. By the age of this year, you need to have achieved that. By the age of this, you need to have so much money in the bank. You need to go and live in this area. You need to drive this car. You need to have this insurance. You need to, have, uh, you need to maybe marry this type of person. Or you need to do this type of job. And all of that is not in itself bad. But the wisdom of man can never take the place of the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of man is always going to want to elevate itself above the wisdom of God. Because, and this now here's a piece of scripture that I want to, that I want to read, and it's in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, and it's from verse 12 until 14. And it says, Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart these words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And that is why the wisdom of man does not want the wisdom of God because the wisdom of man does not understand and can never ever understand the wisdom of God. Because for the wisdom of man, the wisdom of God is folly. folly. It's absolute foolishness and it wants nothing to do with it. And that voice of the wisdom of man continually wants to keep on speaking into our lives. The media, the media either through social media or even through the radio or even through just watching television keeps on bombarding us with the wisdom of man. And we need to be 
attentive of the fact that the wisdom of man wants to come into our life and wants to start elevating us, uh, uh, elevating itself above the, above the wisdom of God, so that it can start influencing us in the way that we make decisions. And I was just so, so, so convicted about this. Because if I, if I can even just take a, a from my, if I can just reflect on my own life, who decided what I should study? Who made that decision? Did I make that decision out of myself or did I actually include God in that decision? Who decided where I should live? Who decided what type of job I should have? Who decided the amount of money that I should have in my bank account? Who decided at what age I must retire? Who decided with whom I should be in a relationship with? Who decided in what area I should stay? And the thing is that we, we are so prone to letting the wisdom of man come into our lives. And we are so unprone or we don't want the wisdom of God to come into our lives because the wisdom of God always wants to live for God and not for man. And man always wants to live for man and not for God. And the wisdom of man wants to come into our life and wants us to start living for ourselves. And then when we live for ourselves, then a pandemic like COVID-19 strikes and our world fall apart if it is built on the wisdom of man. And I can guarantee you that I don't want to be a doom prophet, but things aren't going to start being easier. We do not have a guarantee that things are going to get easier. But if I, if I re- take a look at what stands in the Bible, especially, especially in Revelation, things are going to get tougher. And the wisdom of man is going to start to more and more disappoint us. And it's going to start more and more anxiety to come into our lives, more and more fear to come into our lives. And we need to start saying, but okay, Lord, who do I want to live? Because I'm going to want to live for myself, my kingdoms will start falling one after the other. Because it will not remain standing. And the things that we are giving our lives to is going to start to disappoint us. And if we live for the wisdom of man, we will get to a place where we waste our life on rubbish. And God does not want that for us. He does not want us to live lives where at the end of our lives we don't achieve anything for His kingdom, but we only achieve something for ourselves. So there's a massive fight in our lives between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man. And it's in prayer and in being in prayer that we actually start inviting the wisdom of God into our lives. And then we start battling against the wisdom of man. That we start waging war against the wisdom of man. And it's in actually going before God and allowing Him to speak into our lives that we start building a foundation in our lives that when the storms come, that we can remain standing. But this is not an automatic process. This is something that we need to choose to do every single day of our lives. And it is so important. And I'm not saying these words because I want to condemn anybody. My heart is not to condemn anybody because Jesus did not even come into this world to condemn us. My heart is for us as a church because I need this, the truth that I'm telling or sharing with you guys now, I need this truth just as much in my life because God wants us to remain standing. He wants us to live life and life in abundance. He does not want us to waste our life. So I'm not sharing this because I want you guys to be, con- to, to, to be condemned. I'm not sharing this because I want to you to feel like you're worthless or that you're weak or that you're making wrong decisions. No, I'm sharing this because God wants to shine His light into the darkness that wants to come and overwhelm our lives. God wants to shine His light into our lives so that He can redeem and restore our lives. And even if we find ourselves at a place where we've been living for ourselves, that does not mean that we are worthless or that we now all of a sudden don't have something to live for. God is so gracious that we can literally just go into His presence and say, Lord, I'm sorry. We do not have to go into a place where we beat ourselves up, saying that we've been living for the wisdom of man. We do not have to go into a place where now all of a sudden just now have to maybe 
for five days not read Bible because they're not worthy of reading our Bibles. But God is so gracious that we can come to Him in repentance and we just say, Lord, I'm sorry. And He will come and He will come into our lives and He will help us build our lives on something that will remain standing. But we need to be so aware of the wisdom of man that wants to come and start sneaking into our lives and wants to start elevating itself above the wisdom of God. And what we pray about will, de- will really show what spirit or what wisdom is operating in our lives. Because if we only pray for ourselves, then that means that the wisdom of man is just so at work in our lives. And like I said, we can, even in that, we can just go to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Come and redeem me. Come and restore me. Come and work in me. Come and just show your heart to me. The Bible is just so full of people that failed, but God came into their life and restored them. The story of David is just so evident in that, that even after he slept with someone that was not his wife and murdered that, that lady's husband, God still was at a place that we restored him because he was repentant. He wanted to repent. He was sorry. And he gave God the opportunity to come and work in his life. And that is what I want to say, that even though we find ourselves at a place where we are weak and where we are needy and where we are listening to the wisdom of man, we can just go and sit at the feet of Jesus. And this is now where, this is a truth that I want to read to you guys from, from Luke 10. And this piece of scripture is just, I'm, I'm just in love with this piece of scripture because it just, it's just such a firm foundation in my, in my life knowing the scripture and knowing that this is something that I can hold on to. So I'm reading from Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. And it says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered the village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So when we have the wisdom of man that wants to come into our lives, we can almost see that wisdom of man being Martha, being concerned and troubled about many things, being anxious about many things. This has to happen, this has to happen, this has to happen by this. And that Martha wants to come into our life and it wants to make us anxious, and make us overwhelmed. But we have this promise that just as Mary decided to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his word, And Jesus said that this will not be taken away from Mary. We have a promise that no matter how anxious the world wants to make us, that if we make a decision to go and sit at the feet of Jesus and to listen to His words, that that will not be taken away from us. And we do not need to feel the obligation to just give over to all the anxiousness and give over to all the fears and give over to all of the demands of life. But we can actually come at a place where we prioritize sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to His Word over doing things for God or doing things in this world or achieving things in this world. And it's just so awesome for me that I have this promise that if I want to sit at Jesus, that Jesus will never ever take that away from me. So I can always come and sit at his feet and listen to his voice. So when we are praying, we are speaking about prayer and listening. And I want to conclude by saying that prayer and listening, it's it's like prayer and listening at the feet of Jesus. Going into his presence, knowing who he is, knowing what his character is like knowing what His Word is, knowing what His promises are, knowing what His ways are, knowing that even though the wisdom of man wants to put all of this stuff on my life, that I can say, no, I'm not going to let that come and overwhelm me and make me anxious and influence the way that I make my decisions. But I can have a moment where I can go and sit 
at the feet of Jesus and I can pray and I can actually listen to Him knowing that He wants to speak to me and that He wants to bring His wisdom into my life and that that wisdom has the power to make us as a church remain standing in stormy seasons. So I want to really ask the question that, and now I'm just speaking to each and every single person personally, even though you have somebody sitting next to you, just take this moment and just allow God to come and speak to you. And I want to ask you the question, where are you? Where are you with regards to your prayer life? Where are you with regards to listening to God? What wisdom have you been allowing into your life to be the, the ultimate authority in your life? And like I said, even though if you are at a place where the wisdom of man is dictating the way that you live your life and making your decisions, you do not have to feel worthless. You do not have to feel that you now all of a sudden is a failure and that God cannot use you anymore. God can restore Everything that is broken in your life in an instant, it just takes us to come into humility before God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. So I want once again to ask you, where are you? What is going on in your life? What is the place of Jesus in your life? Are you at a place where you actually believe that God wants to be involved in your life? Are you at a place where you believe that God actually wants to speak to you personally? And if you are at a place that you just want to be touched and want God to come and work in your life and just having a, a time where we respond to God, I just want to pray that the Holy Spirit will come and touch us now. So I'm going to be praying for the Holy Spirit just to come and touch me because I can't decide on your behalf whether you want the Holy Spirit to touch you. But I'm going to be praying for the Holy Spirit to touch me and every single person that actually just want the Holy Spirit to come and touch them now. So if you really want the Holy Spirit to just come and touch you, just as just a sign of inviting the Holy Spirit's presence to come and touch you, just put your hand on your heart as a way of just communicating, say, Holy Spirit, I want you to come and touch me. So Holy Spirit, I just pray that, that you will come and reveal yourself to us. That you will come and touch us. That you will just come and show your presence and come and make your presence known to us. Come and speak into where we are at. Come and bring your grace and just minister this grace into our areas where we are falling short. Lord, and I just pray that you will come and speak to people right now that maybe have never ever heard your voice in their life and that believe that they can't hear your voice. And I just want to come and make the proclamation that it is our inheritance as children of God to know the voice of the Father. Just as every single ch natural child knows the voice of their parents. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will just come and just minister comfort to us. Come and minister your peace to us. Come and minister your presence to us. Come and minister your truth to us. Come and show us. Come and show us even pictures or give us a, a phrase or just give us a piece of scripture that we can meditate on in this time so that we can feed ourselves on your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that that you are more eager to speak to us than we are to speak to you. And thank you that we can have this confidence that you really want to be involved in our lives. 
And I just now want to come and pray against any spirit of condemnation that wants to come and condemn us because of the sins that we have in our life. But we know that if we come to Jesus and sit at His feet in humility, and that if we are willing to repent of our sins, that You are just, and that You will forgive us, and that we can actually stand up from that encounter with You, as if that sin had not taken place, and that you wiped the slate clean. So Holy Spirit, I just pray that the people at home, and even us, will just come and experience how you are wiping the slate clean, how you are taking off the burdens off of our shoulders as we come engage in, with you in repentance, as we are allowing you to come and work in our lives. So I just pray that just after this, after this sermon is done and we all have gone home, that you will be the after minister. And even in this week, that you will come and meet us in our times of devotion. That you will really come and speak to us. That you will come and prove to us that you want to be involved in our lives. And that come and teach us how to pray. Come and teach us how to listen to you. So that in this time of so many unknown, so many things being unknown, that we can remain standing and that we can actually live a God-filled, upright, victorious life. Amen. Yeah, so church, um, I'm just once again, <laughs> this truth is not necessarily something I just even preach to you guys. But I preached it to myself, and this is something that I've made a commitment to, to keep on building my life on. Because I know without this, I will not remain standing. Without this, this world will really just overwhelm me, and I will not survive the world. And like I said at the beginning, our heart behind this sermon series is so that in this uncertain times, we can actually build truths and disciplines into our lives that will help us remain standing so next week we will continue to be speaking about a second discipline that we can build into our lives and Jan will be speaking about scripture and actually having uh, meditating on scripture and building scripture into our lives and I'm just so looking forward to that as well because I am also at a place where I Lord I need to keep on building my life on who you are and I need to keep on building my life on your word and on your scriptures. So I really want to encourage you, do not feel condemned about this. Do not allow a spirit of condemnation to be, to be at work in your life now. But go and sit at the feet of Jesus. Go and sit at the feet of Jesus and during this week spend that time with him. And next week, as we will be continuing with this, come with an expectant heart that, that the Lord wants to keep on building things into your life that will help you remain standing during this time. So I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. And I really want to proclaim over you that you are loved, that you are accepted, that you are just so worthy of having the presence of God and having God speak to you. Not because you are worthy of yourself, but because Jesus Christ made you worthy for God to actually speak to you. And I want to proclaim that over you, that God loves you with an endearing heart. And that His desire is for you and for you to know His heart. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>